Hello everybody, Joe with Fizzle CC here, and today I'm here to share another tip and trick on how to use mesh distortion inside of your games in interesting ways inside of Construct 3. Last time I did share a quick tip and trick around mesh distortion, and it really is an interesting feature that we can use a whole bunch of different ways. So I'll probably have some more videos on just this specific feature because there's some really interesting game mechanics that you can come up with both visually and with how your players interact with your game. So last time we talked about how to use a Bezier curve to influence a shape that your mesh is going to take and be able to dynamically change during runtime. And what we found is that you can actually still have physics and platformer behavior still work uh, inside of that environment, which was really cool. And so building on that, I was like, all right, well, what else can I do? And I decided rather than it being a maybe mechanic that the player is controlling, I want it to be the result of this big asteroid hitting or some sort of large impact like a missile hitting the ground or a boss landing or stomping his club or anything. Uh, and I wanted to be able to think about how could I make my platform ripple out to show like, wow, a really big you know collision just occurred. And so that's what this video is going to be about. So let's go ahead and jump on in. If you do enjoy this video, please consider subscribing, giving me a thumbs up, ringing the bell, all those things. Makes a big difference for me. I'm always excited when I see one come in and it's free for you to do. So thank you so much. All right, let's jump in. This is what we made last time. Uh, just quick refresher, link up above uh, if you haven't watched it yet. And I'm able to control these three points and I'm fitting a Bezier curve through the three control points, left, mid, and right. And the mesh is aligning with that um, the, these yellow helper sprites, which are being driven by that Bezier curve, and it's able to still influence the physics and the platform behavior inside the engine during runtime. So that's awesome. All right, building on that now, let's go over to our new game. This one, we're going to show some uh, pretty interesting impact effects that I was able to build um, inside of Construct 3. Boom, boom. All right, look at that. It's awesome. Well, I was really excited when this started working. So don't know if you're excited, but I was really excited. <laughs> uh, I think we all have those moments as, as game devs when you get something to work that you visualize when you're getting ready in the morning. You're like, ah, you know what? I think I can do this. Well, that was this for me today. So this is really cool. Um, I'm coming in here and this is actually just using mesh def deformation and it's like this ripple effect coming out. And you can tweak all these parameters in terms of how big the amplitude is and how fast it goes and everything. And uh, I'll show you in the event sheet how I created this. Okay, so the first thing to help us understand, because these are really kind of important um, as I talk through this, is I have these three helper sprites. One that I've called impact and then these impact left and impact right. And what they do, just to show you during runtime, if I make them visible, is I spawn them upon collision, I make this impact right in the middle, and then I have with the bullet behavior, these two other helper sprites going out left and right, propagating from where the impact was. So you can understand probably where I'm going with this. I'm gonna use that, the position of those helper sprites to help do the math on how to propagate that wave out. The other thing that's important to know is I am going to use some variables to help drive all this. One is something I'm calling strength, which is think of that as my amplitude of my wave. And one, which is size, and think of that as my period of my wave or how wide I want the wave to be. I'm also using a bullet behavior on this, and the speed I end up using on the bullet behavior will also help influence some of the math, including, for instance, how fast these helper sprites propagate out. I have a feeling like, you know, if it comes in really fast, it should go out faster. If it comes in slow, maybe it goes out a little slower. I mean, that was at least how I set it up. So coming into my event sheet, I won't spend a ton of time on some of the basics because we've already kind of covered that a little bit. And I'm assuming you already know how to use Construct 3 to a degree. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in. So right away on start of layout, uh, there's a couple things that I want to make sure I'm doing. And just a refresher because this is important. I need to make sure that my platform, which I'm going to use this mesh distortion on, I need to store some things initially. And th that includes this bounding box left, right, top, and bottom. That's because we need a starting point for us to build off of uh, when we use the mesh distortion set mesh point feature. We're going to end up using these bounding box points, and it needs to be static before it starts all moving around because we're going to use that as a reference. 
coming back to the event sheet, the other thing I'm doing is I'm setting the size of my mesh. Right now I'm having it every 12 pixels. It can be whatever you want. There is a trade off there. Uh, performance is better if you make it broader, but it doesn't look as good. So if you make it tight, it looks really good, but you start to have some performance issues possibly depending on how many objects you're doing this to. And then what we do is we, we, we're gonna use these helper mesh points, uh, these yellow mesh dots here. And based off of our mesh size, I'm just gonna go and drop one in each of the nodes. And then that's really what I'm gonna do all my math on. And I'm gonna manipulate all those. And then just similar to the last video, I'm going to force the mesh points to set to the position of these helper mesh point sprites. And that's the magic that we discovered in the last video. We're still gonna use that here. So the real trick here is how do I do all the math to make those points propagate in an interesting visual way? Okay, so I have a simple command here. Whenever I tap my mouse button, uh, it fires a projectile. It does a little bit of randomness to add some variety to the speed, and we go on from there. Once I cl collide with the platform, a couple things happen. I spawn that impact block that you saw, and the purple blocks also respond, and they go out and propagate outward using the bullet behavior. As you can see here, it uses the impact speed um, of that initial projectile that we're passing into the impact, and then passing it to here, to determine how fast that goes out. I have it divided by three. You can play with that and, and set it to whatever you uh, want it to be. Okay, now what we're doing is for each of the platforms that we have, I'm looping through. And then I'm looping through each of the mesh points that we have inside of that platform. So um, if we have you know 50 mesh points on that mesh, we're gonna go through 50 times. And what I'm doing is I'm grabbing the appropriate yellow dot, you know, helper sprite uh, that represents that mesh point by looking and seeing, okay, does it match the, the column and row that I should be on? And every single loop, I always reset the initial starting position to what it was the beginning when I loaded the layout. And that's using this self.startY and self.x. The X, I don't really do any math to. I'm just worried about the displacement up and down. So I've stored this self.startY as an instance variable on the uh, sprite itself that I set right upon uh, start of layout. And I need that as a reference to use each time uh, I'm doing math on it so that it's always building off of that initial one. And you'll kind of see why that's important as I show you some of the subsequent equations. So then the next thing I do, um, is really for each point now what i need to do is i need to loop through each possible impact that is on the same platform as that point so let's just say i'm on one of those platforms and i have three impacts going on at the same time i need to look at the effect that each of those impacts has on my y position so because these are waves we're dealing with we really just need to end up adding the result of each of those impacts on top of each other and they might cancel each other out they might add on top of each other and it will look natural because that's how waves really work in real life they just you know they sum or they cancel each other out so we could loop through each of those possible impacts whether it's one two three however many that may be that are still active and then i do three different possible checks that might influence the y position of that specific mesh point the first is I need to know, am I on the left side or the right side? Because I'm going to do the math using the helper sprite going out with the bolt behavior on the left if it's on the left, or the one on the right if it's on the right. And those are largely the same equations, just using those two different references. So I check, is my mesh point to the left of the impact? And then also, is it to the right of that propagating helper sprite? And that's because I don't want the whole platform to just turn on right away. I want to see it traveling outward with that helper sprite so things that are still to the left of it remain flat and the rest have that nice ripple effect i do have a little bit of a correction here which is that impact dot size divided by two remember size is like our period of our wave and that's because i also want to go a little bit beyond the helper sprite because otherwise i was seeing just a sharp drop off to where it was flat and it looked more natural to let it continue down a little bit further so that's why that is uh, not quite just the impact left dot x. Okay, now this is a fun part. Uh, this equation is kind of a bear to get through. Uh, so I'm gonna try to break it down as best as I can. 
what I'm trying to do here is the first part is I need to understand inside of my sine wave that I'm ultimately creating, I'm trying to get a value between negative one and one. And that negative one and one is going to be based off of its distance relative between the mesh point and that item that's propagating outward, uh, that, that sprite that's propagating outward. Once I have that negative one and one, I can multiply that by my strength, which is my amplitude, and that will give me a great starting point. So when I look at each of the elements here in this initial part, what I'm doing is I'm taking the impact left dot X, which is that helper sprite moving out, and I'm subtracting the mesh point dot X. And I'm just getting the absolute value of that. I just want the magnitude. So for this particular mesh point, how far am I from that item that's propagating outward? Uh, and then I take that and I divide that by the impact dot size, which is the period of my wave. Once I know what that ratio is, I need to multiply by 360 because we're using degrees in construct three. If we were using radians, it'd be two pi. Once you do that, you now have your negative one to one. If it's one, it's at the peak of the wave. If it's at negative one, it's at the very bottom of the wave. Now that I have that, I can multiply it by my impact dot strength, which is gonna be, well, how big or how tall or am what my amplitude is in my wave. And once you do that, go ahead and hit play. It'll look really nice. All the stuff past this is really just me playing around, trying to get it to dissipate as it moves further away from the center point of impact. I didn't want it to keep the same amplitude forever. I wanted it to slowly kind of decay. There's a few different ways you can do that. I'm not even really gonna to try to dive into this because I was kind of getting finicky with it. And to be honest, I probably would wanna rewrite this anyways to make it a little bit more natural. But I used a few elements. I used how far I am from the original impact, how far I am from the propagating item. And I also used the factor of how much speed the asteroid had coming in. I want it to be so if it came in really, really fast, it didn't decay as fast. If it came in slower, maybe it decayed faster. Don't know if that helped me or not, but go ahead and try out different things here to get it to decay. Or maybe you don't want it to decay and you just want it to continue to go outward until you know it's off the map. Okay, so with that being said, I copied and pasted this for the right side and just used the other helper sprite to do the math on the other side of the, of the impact. And then this third one, you don't really need this. What this was used for was I was noticing right underneath where the impact would come in. I want, it wasn't looking quite natural. So I created a little bit of an influence here so that within a small window in the beginning, it would actually force it to go down a little bit because I'm, it's an impact. And then as the helper sprites moved out, it actually returned to flat. That's what this equation is doing. Okay, so with all that being said, I, I add these up and I've got my new locations of all my mesh points. And then I go back and I do exactly what I did in the last tutorial. And I use um, this final step, which is do the set mesh point on each of my nodes in my mesh. And I'm going to use this unlurp and the bounding box left, bounding box right, and then the position of the yellow mesh point dot X and mesh point dot Y. And that will result in your, your mesh following those helper sprites. And that's, uh, that's the whole trick. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and now that you know how this works, let's play it one more time. All right, so we got all these guys going on. Oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> oh, I was so happy when this was working. It's actually, uh, I was able to put this together fairly quickly, but I was still so excited uh, when this was uh, first working. So now I want to show you just real quick, can I use this with physics? And we'll only spend a couple minutes on this and then the video will wrap up. If we take what we had in the video over here, these little water droplets, and we drop them into our game. All right, and let's go to our platforms and turn physics on. If I were to do this and hit play, for how many things I got going on, Construct 3 actually will freeze, I think, because uh, it's it's just not able to handle all this um, inside of, the, uh, of a single tick. But I did find I can run this if I lower the amount of mesh points that I'm using. So rather than 12, I'm gonna set this to every 32 pixels. Uh, and hopefully this will work, I believe it will. All right, so I got all this water. Oh yeah, look at that. 
this is awesome. And you know what? The physics is working. I mean, it's not quite as smooth as the other one because, you know, I'm using it every, you know, 32. But if you didn't need to have as many platforms or as many, um, I don't know, interactions going on, you could make some pretty interesting effects just with this on occasion inside of your games. So give this uh, a try. Uh, think about how you can apply it inside of your own games. And, you know, I had a lot of fun putting this together, everybody. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing, giving me a thumbs up, ringing the bell, all that good stuff. And I'll be posting this on my itch page, so look for the link down below. Feel free to download it and play with it inside of your own engine. And with that said, everybody, have a nice day.